It is now time to look at the potential produced by a uniformly charged insulating sphere. We'll have to determine the electric field first, which we've already done earlier. We'll readdress it briefly again. So we have charge Q, volume charge density rho, radius r, an internal radius little r, and an external radius little r as well. So we'll look at all considerations here. So the flux is E times A, E is constant, times surface area. That's that integral of E dot dA with the symmetry benefit of a sphere. And so that's E4 pi R squared, surface area of the sphere. Now the volume charge density is charge per volume. All the charge divided by the entire volume. Every part of the volume has the same volume charge density. So that's what it is. Q enclosed is rho v enclosed. Well, rho is q over v. So q over q over v, that's this, q over v times v enclosed. So there it is, q times v enclosed over v, which is q, little r cubed over big r cubed. We've encountered that relationship before. Everything else divides out. So now e is q enclosed over epsilon zero a. That's our basic way of Simplifying down the Gauss, Gauss, um, Gauss's law to find the E field. So for R bigger than R and R less than R, let's check it out. For R bigger than R, that's easy. E is Q enclosed over epsilon zero A, that's KQ over R squared. It's all the charge enclosed, the entire Q. For R less than R, doesn't encompass all the charge. It encompasses qr cubed over r cubed. So there is uh, q enclosed, q, r cubed over r cubed is all embedded here, but epsilon zero a, the a is, is four pi r squared, so it takes care of two of these r's. So there's only one r left. All right, and now potential. So for R greater than R, well, the same method is used in general, no matter where we're looking at it, which is to integrate the E field from that point out to infinity. So we're gonna start at R and move on out to infinity. So the first segment of E field has an equation inside the material. So we can specify this integral and break it up as follows. Well, we don't even have to break it up because we are bigger than R. So I was showing it being from here, but it's really from this external R. So we're just going from here out to infinity. So it's just from R to infinity, KQ over R squared. And one over R squared minus one over R. So we have K times Q, R to infinity, which is zero, plugging in infinity, minus plug in R, and we have minus minus KQ over R, which is the familiar potential from a point source, which is KQ over R. That hasn't changed. Okay, so how about now when R is less than big R? So we're looking at the potential from inside the uniformly charged sphere. So we have to integrate the E field from that position R to big R, we integrate the E field across that area and we add the E field from integrating the E field from big R to infinity. So we have to go from R all the way out to infinity. Key idea. So that's if we look at the E field that we had for inside, it was KQR over big R cubed. So these are constants and the R is inside the radicand. And so we have to do that integral plus we've already done the integral R to infinity of E dot dr. And that was KQ over R, the potential with respect to the edge of the sphere. So KQ over R cubed, R squared over two from little r to R plus KQ over R. So we can factor out KQ over two R, it's this whole thing, R squared minus little r squared plus KQ over R. And now we can write it as follows. 
this times r squared is kq over 2r. And then this times negative r squared is this factor plus kq over big R. And we can kind of bring terms together here a little bit and come with, up with our potential, which is kq over 2r times 3 minus r squared over big R squared. So that was a fun exercise, and that is the method used to determine the potential from inside the sphere. The conducting sphere in particular. The non-conducting sphere. Well, let's get it right. Well, now let's graph the electric field and potentials in all of space. So starting with the electric field from zero to big R, we noticed that the electric field formula was proportional to R. So there it is. And then outside of the sphere, it acts like a point charge following the inverse square law. And there it is. Now potential. Potential is a little bit more complicated in this case. Here's our formula. So as they're staring at us, we can see what the particular values are. First of all, when r is equal to 0, then this is 3 halves kq over r. So that's the value. Moreover, it's proportional to 3 minus r squared over big R squared. So that's the way in which the curve changes. And moreover, at r, when little r is big R, then this is 1. 2 minus 1 is 2. 2 over 2 is 1. kq over r. kq over r, it acts like a point charge with radius big R. And so this is what it looks like approximately. And then what does it look like outside? Very simple. Get outside of these charge distributions, if they're a nice sphere at least. It's very easy. KQ over R, proportional to 1 over R. And there is the potential. Electric field of potential for a uniform, non-conducting sphere in all of space. Well, now let's consider a long cylinder of uniform charge density. So here's the long cylinder, volume charge density rho, linear charge density lambda, if you think of charge per length of the whole cylinder. Well, let's put a Gaussian surface around it. Isn't that a beautiful Gaussian surface, though I say so myself? And although my radius line from the center of the cylinder to the edge of the Gaussian surface that perspective isn't so nice, but hey, PowerPoint. The width of the Gaussian surface is L. Well, how much charge is enclosed? Let's express it two ways. Lambda L, so the linear charge density times the length, which is also the volume charge density times the volume. So whatever the volume is of the cylinder that's enclosed by this Gaussian surface. And that is volume charge density times pi r squared L. Pi big R squared is big R squared times L. So that would be the total charge enclosed by the Gaussian surface. And just doing a little algebra here, lambda L equals rho pi r squared L. So we can solve for rho lambda over pi r squared. That'll come up in a moment. So let's find the electric field for R greater than R, Q enclosed over epsilon zero, A. All right, well, Q enclosed is what we have, the entire amount underneath that Gaussian surface over epsilon zero, A. Now the area of the Gaussian surface, two pi R, the circumference times the length. It's just the walls, because there's no E field coming out through the ends, so that con does not contribute to the total flux. This gives us rho r squared over 2 epsilon 0 r. Well, we can also express this in terms of lambda, recognizing, well, just replacing this rho with lambda, and then divide by pi r squared, so the r squared is going to go away. We'll end up with a pi underneath here. There it is, folks. Two different ways of expressing the same electric field in terms of volume charge density, linear charge density. 
Now for our less than R. We have the same cylinder, same conditions, but now our Gaussian surface will be inside the cylinder. Little r, length l, finite length. E is Q enclosed over epsilon zero a. The charge enclosed now is little r squared instead of big R squared. Otherwise, the form is the same over epsilon zero a. Some cancellation. And the result, lambda r over 2 pi r squared epsilon 0. Notice the E field up here is inverse proportional to r. Here it's proportional to r. Big difference, obviously. And hmm, you see this lambda over pi r squared? What's that? Well, that's rho. So we can express this as rho r over 2 epsilon 0. There it is. And now we still have to discover the potentials. Okay, before finding the potential at various locations, just want to consider how things would change if the volume charge density was not constant, but was rather some function of R in that long insulating cylinder. Well, then the Q enclosed is found in a slightly different way. We have to find Q enclosed by some R as a function of R. Well, it's the addition of all the DQs. If you add up all the DQs, you get Q enclosed by the region, the Gaussian surface under consideration. And that DQ is rho dV. So you add up all the rho dVs, and rho is a function of R. So it doesn't really matter what that is. Well, it does, actually. We still have to convert dV to dR and that is quite easily done for the case of the long cylinder we have the function the volume charge density function of r and the differential volume is a little tube of size 2 pi r right and r can vary so 2 pi r is the circumference times the length and then so that's the surface area of the tube and then multiplied by dr is the thickness so this is dv, and you proceed from there and do the problem in essentially the same way. We'll come back to that a little bit later. So now, potential for the radius greater than the radius of the cylinder. VAB is VA minus VB, is a general statement. The voltage of A with respect to B, right? And that's the integral from A to B of E dot DL. Now, we set V is equal to zero at a convenient place for an infinite distribution like this. We're going to say V is zero at R is at big R, the radius of the cylinder itself. Then VAB is really V of R moving on out to little r, so R with big R with respect to little r. Big R is the position where the voltage is zero. So VR minus V little r which is 0 minus v little r. So that is equal to this integral. <clears throat> and the limits now, a and b, are big R to little r. So really, we're looking for the potential difference between the edge of the cylinder and the position r outside of that location. So vr is the negative integral of r to little r, v dot dr, dl becomes dr which is negative E, the electric field out there we discovered. In terms of lambda, it's lambda over 2 pi epsilon 0 r. And so we can bring out the constants. And integral of 1 over r dr is natural log of r. And then we, from the limits big r to little r, we get this result. We've seen that before. And that is the potential outside of the non-conducting cylinder. It's the same thing we had for the conducting cylinder. Outside of it, as you're used to by now, it really doesn't matter what's going on inside the cylinder when you look at it from the outside, as long as some symmetry is still maintained, and it is. And now let's consider the potential inside the cylinder, where R is less than big R. And so we're talking about the potential from little r to big r. 
and that's equal to VR minus V big R. The potential of V little r with respect to the potential at this location at the edge of the cylinder. You're over here, you're looking back at this potential and saying, what's your value, V sub r? And in this case, since it's positive charge density, the electric field will be moving outward out of the cylinder, and this potential will be higher because the electric field is kind of going in this direction. All right, so that's Vr minus zero because we define V at r to be equal to zero. So that's integral of little r to big R V dot dr. And the E field inside was already determined to be lambda r over two pi epsilon zero r squared. So bring out the constants, which is a lot of it. Integral of r dr is r squared over two. Plug it in and we get all this constant times r squared minus little r squared. And there you have it. Now let's map it. So mapping, or shall I say graphing, the electric field and potential. The electric field in all of space. Here was the electric field from zero to r. Notice it's proportional to r. So there it is. And afterwards, it's inversely proportional to r. And the value right here at the transition, a couple ways to express it. Notice in this form, if I make little r big r, that's what we have. And then it falls off as an inverse function, just like this. And now potential from 0 to r. Let's throw that equation back up here just to take a look at it again. It's uh, kind of hard to keep all this in mind, I realize. So here's a constant. And we have this that's going to map at the beginning. Of course, when r is really small, this is bigger. So this is positive to begin with. And in fact, when little r is equal to 0, and this goes away, this cancels out with that. And we have lambda over 4 pi epsilon 0. Along the way, it's proportional to this, negative r squared, r, big r squared minus little r squared. And then that's going to look like that. At r, of course, that just goes away. The whole thing becomes 0. OK, what happens between big R and beyond? Well, we had this relationship, negative lambda over 2 pi epsilon 0, natural log of little r over r. So obviously, these are this value is greater than r, so the natural log is positive. And there's a negative in front of the whole thing. So it's proportional negative ln of r over r. And it looks something like this. So we've just done a lot of mapping and graphing of the electric, and electric field and potential functions for these different geometries.